All right, uh, it is Thursday at 12.30, uh, so time for our Team Kentucky update. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about jobs. We're going to be talking about our efforts to uh, seek justice for victims of violent crime. We're going to give you an update on our National Guard activity uh, at the border, and we're going to talk uh, COVID. A uh, number of, of different pieces there and recognize uh, a few great Kentuckians that are out there doing great things. But let's start uh, in how we started the last several weeks, talking about uh, the excitement uh, in Kentucky's economy uh, where we are seeing new project after new project. Today, I'd like to highlight the opening of a new facility in Caldwell County that was announced just over a year ago. Just a little bit later today, Lieutenant Governor Coleman will be joining officials with Porter Road Butcher Meat Company in Princeton, Kentucky, to celebrate the opening of its new USDA-approved meat processing facility. The company is creating 83 jobs for residents in West Kentucky, and I'm happy to say a number of these positions have already been filled since the initial announcement. Moving from a 7,000 square foot facility to a 28,000 square foot operation will greatly boost Porter Road's ability to grow and continue to create jobs for families in and around Caldwell County. Earlier this year, the company received $10 million through Series A fundraising and leaders at Porter Road expect to inject about $12 million into the local agricultural community over the next year. This is clearly going to do big things, and, and this is just the most recent of a number of great announcements in western Kentucky. It is um, a, a string that we know is going to continue. In fact, two weeks from now, I think we're going to have a week that knocks everybody's socks off and followed by a week after that uh, that does even more. So in 2021 alone, we're just six uh, and a half months in, we've announced plans to create more than 4,000 new full-time jobs for Kentuckians. A few recent examples just in the last couple of months. Fruhoff, a semi-trailer manufacturer, is locating in Bowling Green with a $12 million investment, creating 288 jobs. Uh, Kruger Packaging, that's a Canada-based corrugated box manufacturer. I think this is their first U.S. facility. is locating in E-Town with a $114.2 million investment, creating more than 150 jobs. Vila North America, a producer of copper and copper alloy uh, products, is locating its headquarters in Louisville, creating 75 jobs, and locating a recycling facility in Shelby County with a $100 million investment, creating 75 jobs. Firestone uh, Industrial Products in Whitley County in eastern Kentucky, creating 250 jobs related to the electric vehicle market. Uh, Alstrom Monks Joe is a Finland-based manufacturer of glass fiber-based materials locating in Madisonville, another Western Kentucky announcement, $70 million investment, 51 jobs. Kentuckyana Curb Company, manufacturer of commercial HVAC products, has a new facility in Simpsonville, $60 million investment, 700 jobs. Uh, House Foods America Corp is a maker of tofu, locating its first Kentucky facility in Louisville, $146.3 million investment, 109 jobs. Eberspecker, North America, German-owned developer and supplier of exhaust technology, thermal management system, and automotive electronics, also Louisville, $30 million, 214 jobs. Nucor Tubular Products, just the newest investment by Nucor, $164 million, two mil in Gallatin County, 72 jobs. Metalco, an aluminum products producer locating its first facility in Franklin, Kentucky, creating 60 jobs. So Porter Road Meat Company joins uh, these recent announcements. Also the lumber company in Trigg County, not too far away that we announced a couple weeks ago. It just shows how fast we are growing, how exciting uh, this economy is uh, coming out of this pandemic. Uh, so lots of good news on uh, the economic front. But yesterday, uh, we also had the opportunity to make an announcement um, again, that, that follows our, our values. It's a powerful initiative uh, addressing a longtime concern of mine, which is seeking justice for victims of sexual assault and other violent crimes here in Kentucky. So we have a grant from the Department of Justice, a little over one and a half million dollars, that's been awarded to the Commonwealth to create a sexual assault investigative team 
including three trained investigators, one of which we heard from yesterday. It was very powerful, and a criminal intelligence analyst with the Kentucky State Police. The Sexual Assault Kit Initiative, or SAKI, investigative team will have one mission, to investigate sex crimes with a focus on cold cases, where the testing of older rape kits or new DNA that comes into the system gives the possibility for justice where hope has been likely lost. This is going to help victims as they walk the path towards healing um, and hold offenders accountable. This is something I've been working on since I became Attorney General in 2016. Uh, that's when we made ending Kentucky's rape kit backlog and seeking justice for victims one of our top priorities. In my first year as AG, we provided $4.5 million in settlement funds for KSP crime lab upgrades, desperately needed upgrades. We also spent a uh, million dollars making sure that we were teaching victim-centered uh, investigation and, and prosecutorial approaches. In 2017, I created a Survivors Council to advise and assist our office on matters related to victims of crime. Incredibly important, given that most of us can't put ourselves in, in these people's shoes, to have them uh, advising us, helping us lead the way. Following year, we used $3 million in grants to hire a victim advocate, investigator, prosecutor, and Saki coordinator that established this cold case unit. It was around this time we became one of the first states in the country to uh, either test or process each of its uh, kits in the rape kit backlog, testing every kit, including 1,400 we found after the initial audit. But knowing testing is only one step in securing justice, in 2019, we expanded the cold case unit, uh, and we announced yesterday uh, that that investigative arm will be moving over to the Kentucky State Police with the prosecutorial arm staying in the Attorney General's office. Just in the couple years uh, that we had this up and running in the AG's office, we had 10 statewide indictments linked to the backlog. We indicted at least two men, Thaddeus Artis of Elizabethtown and Jason Todd Langston of Louisville, who are accused of being serial sexual assault offenders. One of these individuals, when that indictment came down, uh, I learned had been serving a uh, sentence for someone I knew, an assault on someone I knew who showed up that day. It shows how endemic sexual violence is here in Kentucky and how important it is that we continue to seek justice no matter how old a case is. So I'm thrilled to announce the KSP Saki investigative team is joining Team Kentucky. This is them along with the commissioner. Uh, and Secretary Noble, uh, they're going to do good work. Uh, they know that my, they have my full backing and that we're also watching and expecting results, uh, as are each and every one uh, of those victims. All right, today I also want to make Kentuckians aware that I've received notice from the U.S. Department of Defense and Homeland Security and the National Guard Bureau um, that uh, Kentucky uh, we'll be sending approximately 220 Kentucky National Guard soldiers to support the southwest border mission uh, in late 2021. Kentuckians in uniform have always stepped up uh, to serve and secure our nation, and this mission is no different. These Kentucky National Guard soldiers will be deployed on Federal 10 status and will provide operational and logistic support. What that means is it's a direct request from the federal government from the Department of Justice, from Homeland Security. This is not a request made by several governors that are out there without the backing of the federal government. What it means is we will have a clear chain of command. We will have clear missions that come down through the military, and our Guard's men and women uh, will have uh, the authority that is necessary and also the legal protections uh, that uh, uh, the request by several uh, other governors uh, would not have. Uh, nor would uh, those sent to the border. The Kentucky National Guard soldiers will join the estimated 3,000 Guard personnel requested from other states to support the mission. Let's be thankful for the hard work and sacrifice of these soldiers, and I know every day their actions are working to build a better Kentucky and a better America. We want to thank them for their service and their continued service, and it's likely this mission will begin around October in the next uh, federal fiscal year. All right, with that, let's move to a couple of, of COVID-related uh, pieces of news, and we're going to have Dr. Stack address us in just a second. 
Uh, but let's start with our shot at a million sweepstakes. So last week we announced our first shot at a million sweepstakes winner and the first five winners for a full ride to higher education here in Kentucky. I guess one of the best days uh, I've had since I became uh, governor. Uh, we got to make a real difference in six people's lives, and you could see it on their faces, and each of their stories was just a little bit different. And it, but it, each and every one of them were rewarded for just doing the right thing, the smart thing, protecting themselves, their families, and their communities. And there are now still two more opportunities to win. And this is just us getting started. Our first million dollar winner, Patricia Short, had a very simple message for her fellow Kentuckians. Get vaccinated, register, you can win too. And our youth winners, what a great group of inspiring young Kentuckians. They came from all over the state. Uh, Jalen Crudup from Elizabethtown, I was so proud of him. Uh, he was so nervous at that microphone, he stepped up, he knocked it out of the park. Uh, Crystal Frost uh, from Crestwood, uh, one of my favorite calls I made that very first day. She was working her job, and her mom had called and said, why don't you take three minutes off? And I think she was in a back room getting that call. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is it. Uh, Tyler Henson from Mount Sterling. When I called Tyler, it was his birthday, and it was the first call I made. On his birthday, he won a free higher education. Uh, Addison Sullinger from Princeton uh, talking about uh, her pediatrician giving the advice, trusted uh, advisors. And then Alex uh, Vonderhauer uh, from Louisville, one of our two uh, younger winners who again uh, stepped up with no trepidation to, to that microphone, um, proud of him. I can't wait to see what these young people uh, do, what they accomplish, and I know Kentucky uh, can't wait either. Uh, remember, we have two more drawings. The next one is just three weeks away. If you already registered for the first drawing, you're in. You don't need to do anything else, but people can still register if you've been vaccinated, or better, go get vaccinated and sign up right now. Uh, I remember Patricia Short said, this doesn't happen, and her husband said it does in Kentucky. So please, uh, get your shot uh, at a million. Any Kentuckian, 18 or older, who's received at least their first dose of Pfizer or Moderna, or the one-shot J&J vaccine can register. And if you've registered for the first drawing and didn't win, so everybody but Patricia is still in for the next two drawings. If you're 12 to 17, and again, you've gotten at least your first shot uh, of hope, you can still sign up or stay signed up to win 10 remaining scholarships. So far, 660,721 660721 Kentuckians have signed up for the shot at a million. Almost a quarter of those, 177,846, have signed up just in the last week. In other words, since we announced the first set of winners. Uh, 36,800 young Kentuckians have entered to win a full scholarship. It's been about 5,000 new entries since our last drawing. Now, we saw what a difference this is going to make uh, in these young folks and their families, so please, uh, come on, parents, sign up, get your kids vaccinated. On a personal note, a little bit later today, I'm taking my son, Will, 12 years old, to get his second shot. Uh, said over and over because it's, it's at the core of who I am. I love my wife and my two kids more than life itself. I'd give my life for them any day within a nanosecond. I trust these vaccines. That's why we're going to be with Will this afternoon when he gets his second shot, which is incredibly important, especially with the Delta variant, to get both shots. Uh, just this week, since we announced our winners on Friday, we've had more than 15,000 new people get vaccinated. That's a better week than we've seen in many weeks in the last oh, oh, six to, to eight weeks. And that is now 142,721 Kentuckians vaccinated since we announced the shot at a million. We believe and we're encouraged that this is working. It's always going to be hard to tell exactly how much because we don't know how many people would have signed up otherwise. We were certainly seeing declining vaccinations, which is what we would um, uh, have presumed, um, but they are in the very least holding steady even as uh, we move into a more difficult to convince set of populations. You factor all that in, I believe what we are doing is right. So if you haven't already gotten your vaccine, go to vaccine.ky.gov to find a location near you.
All right, um, I'll give one more uh, update and then we'll ask Dr. Stack to, uh, to come up. And this is a lot about the loss that we've experienced and how um, we're memorializing it and, and our next step in, in that direction as, as our, our current reality is, is certainly a little different today than it was in, in December. So on March 6th of 2020, when the first case of COVID was confirmed in Kentucky, few of us could have imagined the staggering impact and the heartbreaking loss that we would experience. Now more than a year later, we've lost over 7,250 people. My faith teaches me every single one of these are, are children of God, individuals that cannot be replaced, that are missed by their families, their communities, and because of the difficulty of celebrating someone's life during COVID-19, that grief has probably not been processed for many of them. I don't know about those watching or, or here with us today, but um, more and more of these memorials now occurring months, uh, maybe even up to a, a year after the passing. So today, um, we're talking about uh, our continued intention to honor uh, those Kentuckians. We're going to begin moving today uh, from what we've been doing, which is placing a flag at the back of the Capitol for each Kentuckian lost, to further work on the permanent memorial that we're going to have here on the Capitol grounds. Today we begin that transition to the permanent Team Kentucky Memorial. After announcing the memorial plan in March of this year, more than 80 artists from across the country sent in their qualifications and a statement of interest. From that group, a panel of experts drawn from both state government and local arts organizations recommended 11 finalists, six of which are either Kentucky artists or have strong ties to Kentucky. The finalists were notified this week and now they'll begin to submit in-depth proposals for their vision. One artist will be awarded a commission to create a permanent memorial to honor those lost and the sacrifices made by our people, our communal experience in, in dealing with the pain and the get difficulty, but also the, the heroism of so many out there. As we select the final design, it's important that we hear from Kentuckians most impacted by COVID-19. I will be establishing a Team Kentucky COVID-19 Memorial Community Advisory Panel, which is gonna include family members of loved ones, uh, of those that were lost, as well as healthcare heroes, first responders, and COVID-19 survivors. This panel will provide input on the design proposals, ensuring a memorial is created that properly honors the loss, the sacrifice, but also the amazing actions of so many Kentuckians. For those interested in learning more or applying to be on the panel, please visit tah.ky.gov. And as we're making this transition, also starting today through next Thursday, Kentuckians who wish to have a flag from the current memorial uh, in the back of the Capitol can come collect one from the Capitol grounds. All flags will be removed uh, next Friday, July 16th, but if a family member or loved one would like a flag but is unable to collect it, uh, please contact our constituent services and we'll be sending those flags to any family that lost someone that would like to have that um, as just one small uh, way to remember them. I know that this has been a deeply meaningful um, temporary memorial. It's been one where I remember the first planning and thinking how many flags there were and it now stretches uh, the entire uh, back of, of the Capitol. It's reminded us each day during the most difficult times uh, of this fight that what we're fighting for is very real. It's the lives of the people around us. Um, this permanent memorial uh, we're going to work hard to make sure is one that, that properly recognizes this period that we've been through. And, and to everybody who, who has lost a loved one who wants one of those flags, we want to make sure that, that you get it. All right, with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Stack to come up here, give us an additional update on where we are with COVID. Then we'll recognize a few Team Kentucky All-Stars and take questions. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, if you could put up my slides, please, James. We'll do six slides in hopefully about five minutes or less and do a little public health science today. So we have over 2.2 million Kentuckians who have been vaccinated with at least one dose of vaccine so far in Kentucky. Uh, state data is actually 2.21 million, 
and the federal data is 2.22 million. So it's somewhere in that range, and that's a wonderful success, but we need to do more. If we can show the next slide, please. This is from the federal website. For those of you who are interested in data, CDC COVID Tracker has really grown and become much more robust over this journey. This, we're not going to go into all the details. The point I want to make, though, is the gray or the darker colors on each of these show the number of cases of COVID. The blue shows the percent of people vaccinated, and it's broken down by age ranges. And what you see for all of these is that as the vaccination rate increases, the rate of disease has gone down. And you see it, interestingly, in some of the populations, like in the top right, the 16 to 17-year-olds, it was relatively stable until the percent vaccinated reached a certain amount, and then it started to go down. So vaccines work. There, this is a whole run of data from December 4th to present. That's on or December 14th, rather, 2020, to uh, July 2nd on the federal website. I'm going to show you Kentucky-specific data on the next slide, James, please. These bars show the um, difference between, uh, in cases between vaccinated and unvaccinated. We have March, April, May, and June as separate months. There's two themes I want to draw out from this. First of all, the relative risk reduction. If you get vaccinated, your risk of getting COVID is profoundly lower than if you are unvaccinated. So that's the difference in the height between the gray bars on the left and the blue bars on the right. So for every one of these months, the risk is reduced by as much as four to eight fold if you are vaccinated versus being unvaccinated. So getting vaccinated makes you much safer than someone who is unvaccinated. It does a second thing though, and this is the height of all the bars. You can see that they've all gotten shorter from the left to the right. The more of us who get vaccinated, the fewer uh, bodies are out there for the, for the virus to multiply in, and the overall burden of disease goes down. So there's two things we have to do, protect ourselves and protect others, which includes our loved ones, our family, our friends, our communities. And the way we protect all of us is for all of us to get vaccinated. If you look globally, low single-digit percentage of people are vaccinated. Less than 5% of the global population is vaccinated. None of us are safe until all of us are safe. We have to stop allowing so many opportunities for the virus to multiply uh, and propagate because, James, if you could show the next slide, you'll recognize our purple stair-stepper slide. And I said um, at the June 10th or 11th press conference, rather, that this one I could probably tell a million stories off of from our journey for the COVID pandemic. But the part we're going to focus on is the far right. We had eight consecutive weeks of decreasing cases in Kentucky it was interrupted last week by an increase. And so though the bars are much smaller than they have been during the winter, the uh, most recent week, last week, had an increase, less than 100 new cases more than the week before. The positivity rate is also going up. It's increased over uh, more than one percentage point over the last eight or nine days. I think those are real increases. I think the, the positivity rate's going up and the cases are going up. Now the real question will be, will the vaccines help to keep those at lower levels and will it keep the hospitals and the ICUs from getting filled up and will it keep people safe and protected from uh, serious permanent harm and or death? And so all the evidence we have so far shows that these vaccines are wildly protective and very helpful. They're not perfect though. So if we could show the next slide, James. The media is replete with stories of the Delta variant. This is real-time, actively evolving, real-world science. I want to show you how quickly things can change and why it's really important that people do not get complacent. You can't take this virus casually. And like the governor has said before, the immediate crisis has passed, but the pandemic has not. We are still in the midst of a once-in-a-century global pandemic. This is from the CDC COVID uh, website. They have a tab for genomic surveillance. This shows the sequencing across the country and what percentage of the variants, um, or what percentage each variant comprises of the total uh, samples tested. I want you to see the orange one, the one that's getting alarmingly big on the far right. In the span of eight weeks, Delta variant has gone from 3.1% to 10% to 20%, I'm sorry, to 30%. And so now uh, they project it that the next two-week cutoff will be 51%. So just to get that right, 
Let's use 3%, 10%, 30%. That's a tripling every two weeks, just to make that real simple. And then 51% is projected for the next timestamp, which will be um, the period concluding Ju July 22nd. Remember, there's a multi-week delay in this. Our numbers are increasing and will increase for the Delta variants in Kentucky. We update that once a week. I don't have a, a new update numbers for you, but it will increase. So just, just prepare yourselves for that. It's going to increase. 26? Yeah, so the number of Delta variants is 26. Is a percent of the total it's going up to is so for our total uh, variant sample. This is important because the Delta variant is two and a half times or so more effective in spreading, which means that if it gets in your community, it's going to spread real fast. That's why it's growing so quickly, and it can hurt people. It may be a little bit more dangerous than the other ones. Now, the vaccines, the early data have shown, are incredibly protective against this. They may not be as protective as against, say, the, uh, the other variants that have been found so far. That will take some time to find out. But here's the bottom line. The single thing you can do to protect yourselves and protect all of us is to get vaccinated. And we still got about 35 to 40 percent of the population who we really need to go out and get yourself safe with vaccination and help keep others safe. Uh, as far as boosters for the fall, that's to be determined. We have to find out. Uh, do we lose protective immunity or do viruses learn to circumvent the protective immunity? And it's too early to make that determination. But the federal government is planning um, in case we need to deploy boosters in the fall. And the final slide, James. I want to share an example. We're going to start thinking about summer practice for sporting teams and going back to school in the fall. This is also from the CDC website. It talks about what fully vaccinated people can do. Some samples are you can resume pretty much all activities without wearing masks, except for going in those small subset of places where you're required, which are public transportation, nursing homes, and healthcare facilities. You can resume domestic travel, and you don't have to get tested before or after domestic travel. These are big deals. But the bottom three I want to draw your attention to. You can refrain from testing following a known exposure if you're asymptomatic. You can refrain from quarantine following a known exposure if you're asymptomatic, and you can refrain from routine testing in most circumstances. If you have a football team with 50 people on it, think about a high school varsity football team. If 20% are vaccinated and 80% are not, let's use two different scenarios. Let's say 20 of the kids get uh, exposed to a positive case on the team. That means you're going to have to quarantine 16 of those people. Your team just went from 50 people to 34 people. All right. I don't know if you can field a team, but the likelihood is you're going to lose some important players if you can even keep the team going. Because remember, the vaccinated kids don't have to quarantine as long as they don't have symptoms. Let's make it a little more dramatic. If you're in a locker room with all these kids for more than 15 minutes and you have one positive case, every single one of them counts as an exposure because they're probably all unmasked and they're all close together. If the whole team, and we did this last year, we had whole teams that had to be quarantined and so they couldn't compete. If you are only 20% vaccinated, that means 40 of the kids have to be quarantined. Now, I don't think you can field a football team with just 10 kids out of the 50. If they're 80% vaccinated, though, only 10 of them have to be quarantined. You still have 40 players if they don't have symptoms, and you might be able to have a team. So here's the bottom line. Coaches, parents, kids, you want to play sports, the single best thing you can do is go out and get vaccinated because as long as you don't have symptoms, which is what happens most of the time with people who get exposed who are vaccinated, you don't have to quarantine, and you can keep on practicing, you keep on playing. And the final word would be about the vaccines and myocarditis and pericarditis. All of the analysis shows that the risk of the virus is many-fold more than any risk from the vaccine. And keep this in mind. If you're one of the unlucky ones who has something like a myocarditis or pericarditis so far, not a single person has died from it. They have all recovered and, and all appear to be going on to do fine. But if your body responded that strongly to a vaccine, you just might respond even worse to the real infection. And so, hands down, I had my kid vaccinated, and I recommend all parents go ahead and get your child vaccinated if they're 12 and up. Uh, all the experts out there have so far continued to advise that that's the best course of action. So, Governor, thank you very much, and I hope folks um, are enjoying your summer. But we're not out of the woods yet, and your action still makes a big difference. Thank you. All I'd add to Dr. Stack's presentation is the same analogy that he used with a football team applies to a classroom too. You know, I want I want my kids to be in school, 
in the classroom all of next year. Now, how much of a class would have to quarantine versus to be able to be in the classroom uh, depends on the levels of, of vaccination. So parents, if, if you want to make sure that your kids uh, get that full year of in-person instruction and don't have to have two weeks here and two weeks there in quarantine and the schools to also have to go through that as well, you know, please uh, make sure that you get your children, uh, if they qualify, vaccinated before the beginning of the year. All right, so last thing we're going to do, um, which I forgot one of the weeks already, is to celebrate some of the all-stars on Team Kentucky, people who represent the best of the best of this Commonwealth. First, I want to recognize Hodgenville Police Chief James Richardson. James has introduced the idea of placing autism awareness stickers for residents in Hodgenville who have autistic family members in their home. Uh, this response to the project, I mean, the response has been incredible, and, and it really shows what can happen when you connect the special needs community and law enforcement officials, uh, and it's been a great way to raise awareness uh, for autism and for Kentuckians with autism. Also, I want to celebrate Madison Lilly. Madison was just named the SEC Female Athlete of the Year. She is the second female student athlete from Kentucky to win this award. If it wasn't enough, Madison's the first ever volleyball player to win this award in the history of the SEC. That's a big deal, and we are so proud of her for her achievement, and we thank her for bringing some honor right here to the Commonwealth. Finally, I want to give a shout out to an incredible young man, Trayvon Davidson. Trayvon is an alum of Ballard High School in Louisville and a student at Tennessee State University. Trayvon spent five months collecting shoes, and he donated 343 pairs to a local organization in Louisville. Trayvon said he only stopped collecting donations because he ran out of room to store them. He plans on holding a drive to donate more shoes every year. So thanks to Trayvon for giving back to your community in a big way. Um, all of our normal reports um, are out or will be coming uh, out um, later this afternoon, um, just to touch on the vaccination number. Um, today, our Kentucky numbers and the, the federal numbers are normally a little bit ahead of us. 2,212,708 Kentuckians with at least their first shot of hope. 83% of Kentuckians 65 years and older. The federal website, I think, has 86% uh, percent of that group vaccinated, moving in the right direction. We all want to go a little bit faster. So with that, We'll open it up to questions. We'll go through um, those that, that signed up and get everybody else. Uh, we'll make sure we get everybody in. Let's start with uh, Stu Johnson. Thank you, Governor. Uh, what percentage of deaths to this point have been Delta-related, the Delta variant? And I guess I'll add on to that. The, with your 2.2 million people that have been vaccinated thus far, how concerning is it with the Delta variant out there that it's not higher? Uh, so I don't believe we have a number on deaths related to the Delta variant. So we've got 26 confirmed cases of the Delta variant because you don't sequence every single case that, 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 that comes in. Um, we anticipate that our numbers overall of cases in the Delta variant are about where the federal government thinks they are, which is about 50 percent of those cases. Uh, now, it is more aggressive. Uh, it appears to be uh, to cause serious illness um, at, a, at, a, at a higher rate, certainly for certain age groups. But remember, we see, we, in part, we see it at hitting people from different age groups because older people are vaccinated, right? And so that, that, that moves it uh, a little bit. But you would think um, that, that, that the death number would be at the case number or more it being more uh, virulent than, than the others. But I don't think we have a specific number, do we? Right. Well, I want everybody to be vaccinated. Uh, I want to I want to move through um, all of this, but uh, we've got a lot of good news in our, our our vaccination numbers. While at the same time, we're not satisfied with them. Eighty three to eighty six percent of Kentucky and sixty five and older being vaccinated. I'm thrilled with. Again, I want it to be ninety nine or one hundred percent. But these are still the most vulnerable, even for the the, the Delta variant. Uh, total population, there was a while where we were wondering when we cross 50 percent of all Kentuckians, um, we are there. Um, we don't see our vaccination numbers, even though we're reaching harder to convince populations, 
trailing off um, more and more and more and more, which we were seeing for a while, so uh, holding steady. Uh, hospital capacity uh, is also in really good shape at the moment. And, and if the, the Delta variant continues and if we see more cases, how that, how that impacts hospital capacity, given you're going to have fewer people 65 and older who would need um, uh, hospitals at a, at a higher rate than others. Um, and then the, the overall number of people vaccinated lessening those who are most at risk. You know, we'll have to watch and see uh, what may happen there. So, listen, the Delta variant is serious, but it doesn't change um, any of where we are. Number one place is where we are is get vaccinated. It protects you. It protects you from what we were dealing with before, 88% effective according to the CDC against the Delta variant. That's pretty darn good for any vaccine. If you won't get vaccinated, wear a mask when you're around other people. It's a smart thing to do. Uh, Sarah Ladd, Courier-Journal. shortage um, in Kentucky around the country. And I'm just curious if the state has any plans to publicly encourage mass blood donations or incentivize that in any way. Uh, you know, I, I need to check with our Department uh, for Public Health and our Cabinet for Health and Family Services. Certainly, we've got a blood mobile in the back uh, of the Capitol. I think today it was certainly there on uh, yesterday. Uh, people may still be a little bit hesitant um, given uh, COVID, but it's something that we absolutely need. We would hate to see a type of situation that we saw in India with oxygen um, hitting people for routine. Uh, procedures that, that they might need blood uh, at. So let me at least take the opportunity today to say uh, donate. Uh, we need to make sure that when people need help, they can get the help they need. Uh, Melissa Patrick. Um, hi. Um, so why is it that um, we don't have access to the exact percentage of Delta variants in Kentucky? Why, why is the CDC not providing that level of of data, and is that something that we need to be concerned about? Well, I think it, we, we could take those 24 cases over all of them and get a percentage, but it's not going to be accurate in what they believe it, it actually is. When you look at what it takes to sequence uh, one of these cases, I think, I, th I think they're right to extrapolate um, and, and to know that we in Kentucky aren't in a different place than anybody else at, at what this variant is, is likely looking like. Um, it, same with the, with the UK variant. Uh, the B117, when we looked at it, you know, our numbers, um, it's still, if, if, if you looked at, at the report that we put out later today, you know, we're now hundreds of, of the UK variant were you know, in the 40s, I, I think, no, in the 20s of the, uh, of the Delta variant. But we know the Delta variant is, is, is moving in and is at a higher rate. We, people need to, people who are unvaccinated at this point need to assess their risk that they will get the Delta variant and not anything else. And unvaccinated people who, who won't get the vaccine and aren't wearing masks at this point um, ought to assume in their risk calculation that they are going to get COVID of some sort. Uh, certainly, we don't want that to happen. Uh, and when we look at overall where we are, and, and, and we'll have to watch it as it goes forward, we have those that are vaccinated. We have those that have had COVID that have some level um, uh, of antibodies as well. Uh, we're in a better position than probably all but two of our surrounding states, but still, we want people to get vaccinated. I mean, every every single piece of news that comes out shows how important this is. Uh, Tom, Latek. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon to you. Um, with two of our neighboring states, Arkansas and Missouri, being among the highest rates of the Delta variant, are you looking at all at possibly reinstituting a mask mandate? And the question is whether I'm, I'm looking at reinstituting a mask mandate with what's happening in some other states. Uh, Dr. Fauci, in talking to uh, governors on Tuesday, said, I'm not making any recommendations in that area because the number one thing you ought to do is go get vaccinated. If getting that shot protects everybody to a significant degree, um, then asking uh, others to take that other step, I think is premature right now. Um, again, as we move towards things like school and big team sports, we're going to need, um, uh, especially our younger people, to step up and, and get vaccinated. Uh, or as we get closer to school, we may have to look at, at different options uh, there. Carolina. 
Are you concerned by the fact that we did have that? It's a small increase, yeah, but about 10%. It, it was an increase. Is that something that Kentucky should be concerned about? So the question is, um, am I concerned about the, about the 10 percent increase from um, uh, the week before to the last reporting week? Also, um, the, the positivity rate going up uh, at least a point. I mean, yes, I worry about everything COVID related. That's, that's uh, part of our job, but we're not seeing a big corresponding increase in hospitalizations, in serious illness. With the Delta variant out there, we ought to assume that we will see um, uh, numbers uh, increase at least some. Uh, but that depends, again, on whether it motivates people to get vaccinated. Um, we don't want to see any variant out there, um, but we are, are blessed that the vaccine works well against it, and we hope that it motivates people. But yes, we're going to watch it, and, and we're going to watch it carefully. Is that possibly mainly among the unvaccinated Oh, yes. At this point, 90-plus um, percent on any given week um, I, I think significantly higher than that. You know, we had one month where it was 99%, um, and we can break out those numbers, are in unvaccinated individuals. The, the chart that, that we showed from different months, you know, shows the, the vast degree. Um, and, and then that's only if you get it, right? And so the question is, if you get it, if there's a breakthrough case, how serious is it? And most of the time, not nearly as serious as, as it is if you're unvaccinated. But no question that the vast majority of our cases now, um, including um, any increase in the last week, is among unvaccinated Kentuckians. Alex. Um, I guess why aren't you at least considering right now changing the guidance on wearing a mask even indoors? Knowing because so much of, I feel like, what you have issued over the last year has been preemptive to sort of ward off the threat. Obviously, if you're vaccinated, it's the safest way to protect against the virus, but knowing that the potential is there for another surge, why not go ahead and ask people to wear masks indoors? What's the, what's the sort of main thing? Well, I, th I think the potential for a surge is very different now than it was in the past. Certainly in the very beginning, in March of 2020, we didn't know how to treat it. Uh, we didn't have good testing uh, for it. It was incredibly deadly at that time. We didn't fully know how it spread. Uh, you moved into July, and we were able to do slightly different things because we knew that in places like restaurants where people would take off their masks, you know, this thing would would spread more. Um, we saw a dramatic dip in December and January when things uh, were so awful. Um, it, it, toughest, toughest couple months, certainly, um, of my life, and I know of everybody else's with the, the, the loss that we had, what, what vaccinations uh, can do. So I'd say a couple of different things. Number one, um, the, the level of protection our most vulnerable have is significantly more now, 83 to 86% of 65 and up Kentuckians already being vaccinated suggests the overall potential loss of life is significantly less. Uh, total population, about 50% of the population, 88% affected, 88% uh, protected or more. Uh, hospital capacity being in a very different place now than it was before and the potential uh, amount of people uh, going to one of those facilities, given the overall level of vaccination now, um, also different. And then it's the national experts aren't suggesting it to us at all. I mean, we've, we've, I've always listened to, to Dr. Fauci. Sometimes we've made some different decisions, but on Tuesday when he said the number one thing and really the only thing that you ought to be pushing as hard as you can right now is get people vaccinated. And, and that's also where we are right now in that an individual has a choice to get significant protection from the Delta variant. Uh, or or not. So again, we're always going to be flexible. We're always going to watch this, but I'm not at a point where I think we need to um, uh, put in any type of, of, of mandate. But I do want to be clear that since we removed the mask mandate, we said if you're not vaccinated and you're indoors with a group of people other than your family, wear a mask. And, and that hadn't gone away. Anybody else? Tom? Yeah. yeah. On, the, on the totally different subject, this has to do with your uh, National Guard right. uh, information. Uh, you probably can't identify the units yet, but can you tell us what type of uh, National Guard units will be deployed to the border? Uh, at, at this time, we, we can't um, identify or disclose that. It's it's uh, the notice that we got is subject to change. Our expect our expectation is we will be providing support um, to to others uh, on on the border, and we have in the past, and we have. 
in the past several years. But again, this is the type of direct request from the Department of Defense and the Homeland Security uh, that you proudly answer the call for, and it provides the, the type of needed protections in that mission for your National Guard uh, men and women. Uh, I believe that the Commonwealth's position is still. We removed the, the language you asked for. Uh, you said that that contract would protect your rights. Um, here it is. And I think Sunrise is still asking for new things to be written in. Uh, so, again, if the contract uh, uh, protected the, the rights that Sunrise believes needed to be protected with that language omitted, it's now omitted. If this is really about the kids, it's time to sign the contract and move on. How are we doing with vaccination rates when it comes to those who are school age yeah. and can be vaccinated? Uh, so when it comes to, to back to school, first we got to recognize that right now kids under 12 can't get vaccinated. We believe that's coming in September. That's what Pfizer has been uh, telling the, the public. Uh, when it comes to 12 to 17, not enough. Not enough, and we need more. So what we're doing is we're trying to plan with superintendents of each school district um, back to school vaccination clinics and, and, you know, scaling them out, what with Pfizer five weeks out uh, so that you could have both shots in the two weeks on top, uh, Moderna six weeks out uh, so you could get to that, that full uh, immunity. Uh, we think that, that going back to that setting and if parents know the difference in what's required in quarantine or not quarantine, because it may impact the parents too, and their ability to, 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 to go to work, then, then hopefully it'll provide an additional impetus to get people vaccinated. Uh, but I, you know, I, was asked, I was asked a question the other day of, of you know, what, uh, what can you say to, to folks that haven't been vaccinated yet to get them vaccinated? And if I knew that, I'd say it. I'd say it eight, nine, 10 times a day, a minute, uh, an hour, but we keep pushing and we keep getting more people signed up. And, and at this point it's a grind, right? But, but we're willing to do that work if it's, 1,000, 3,000, 5,000 people a day. We just pushed through it, but certainly as we go back to school, uh, we're gonna need to see those numbers increase. And if we don't, I think you'll see some examples in, in Kentucky where uh, you might see schools having to, if, if, there's, if there is a critically low percentage of people vaccinated, you may see entire schools that have to, to shut down for two weeks and go virtual, and none of us want that. And are, are yeah. you having good, uh response from the superintendents with uh, the partnerships to get these clinics to you? Yes. Are they taking you up on the offer? Yes. And, and, you know, it's, it's working through local health departments too. Some of them go ahead and, and do it with our hospital systems. Uh, but right now, yes, we, we are seeing, uh, I don't know that we have a superintendent that doesn't want more of their, of their kids vaccinated. They've seen uh, the impact and, and working uh, well with us. Um, certainly here in Frankfurt, because I get the emails as a parent too, um, they're combining them with the physicals uh, that kids have to get for certain things. So come in, get your physical that you need for school, get your vaccine uh, as well. So the amount of the proposed memorial, and where is it going to be located? Uh, is it going to be located yes. here on the site, or is that something the panel will decide? So it's going to be located on the site because we actually have a memorial park here uh, on the Capitol. Uh, if you know where the Gold Star Family Monument is that we, we put in, if you're looking at the Capitol, it's on the right. It'll be some area, some, some part of that grassy area that is right there. We think overall uh, the memorial will come in uh, somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars all of which will be achieved through, through private donations. Uh, but want to make sure when it comes to the uh, ultimate design and construction that, that we hear especially from us, we're, we're all going to have an emotional reaction looking at and being around a, a memorial like this. It's a shared experience of of pain, but also of, of, of triumph, of, of despair and hope, of, of so many different emotions that we've all felt so viscerally. Uh, we want to make sure those that, that feel those even more than many of us, um, you know, have a direct say in, in how it's going to look uh, to make sure it, it, um, it memorializes those that are lost and it honors those that uh, sacrifice so much. All right. Thank you all very much.